What's up guys, it's DDP, and today I'm going to talk to you about five roster moves Mark Cuban regrets in his tenure as Mavericks owner. All that's coming up after the bumper. Now obviously talent evaluation and financial planning around an NBA salary cap is no easy task. It's a brutal, often thankless job, in fact. To look at a player, sometimes a kid as young as 19 or 20 years old, and be able to project if he's going to continue to mature and then elevate his game to become a real player, or at bare minimum hold current form, is no easy task. In fact, it's nearly impossible. And no one, no matter how good they are, has a perfect track record at doing this. And while many of the moves on this list occurred after the Mavericks loan championship in 2011, there are some that actually date back more than a decade. Sure, the Mavericks have a young, promising core now, but that doesn't mean we can't think to ourselves, what if? <laughs> Number five. Trading for Lamar Odom. Ah, the Lamar Odom trade. On paper, it looked like a steal. A trade exception worth $8.9 million for the reigning sixth man of the year? What's not to like? Oh, just the fact that Lamar Odom would be so aloof during his 50-game tenure with the Mavericks, while hiding a coke problem, mind you, that the defending champion Mavericks would effectively banish him from the team and send him home before they even reached the playoffs. A playoff series in which they were swept by the Oklahoma City Thunder. Ouch. In his time in Big D, Lamar Odom averaged just 6.6 .6 points and 4.2 rebounds on 35% shooting from the field and 25% beyond the arc. What's more, he shot a mere 59% at the charity stripe. That's hardly befitting of a reigning sixth man. In all honesty, this one's hard to pin solely on Mark Cuban, as it made sense at the time. But regrets aren't limited to simply poor decisions. What's more interesting is that the Lamar Odom trade exception would find its way from the Lakers to Houston, where it would then be used as part of a trade package to land James Harden in H-Town and send what would become Steven Adams and Kevin Martin to the Oklahoma City Thunder. The hard move would then pique Dwight Howard's interest and lead to Mark Cuban's top free agent target in 2012, ultimately spurning the Mavericks for the Houston Rockets. So that's a blow to the ego for sure. Ultimately, the ghost of the Lamar Odom trade thwarted a Dallas free agency pickup the following summer while making an in-state rival in Houston a serious contender. Not exactly the way the Mavs brass drew it up. Number four. Trading for Rajon Rondo. You knew this one was going to make the list, didn't you? Of course it had to. The blockbuster trade that ended up being little more than a ball buster for the Dallas Mavericks. Attempting to solidify the core of the Mavericks for the future around the likes of Rajon Rondo, Monte Ellis, Chandler Parsons, Dirk Nowitzki, and Tyson Chandler, now in his second stint in Big D, mind you, Cuban pulled the trigger on the trade, sending reserve forward Brandon Wright along with guard Jameer Nelson and forward Jay Crowder, not to mention a 2015 first round pick and a 2016 second round pick to Boston in exchange for the prima donna point guard. So what happened? Well, similar to the Lamar Odom situation, Rondo would clash with teammates and coaches and quickly flame out, being sent away from the team in the midst of their first round playoff matchup with the Houston Rockets. The Mavericks claimed it was due to an undisclosed injury, but we all know the truth. Rondo quit on this team, and the Mavs' leadership knew it. So with their supposed stud point guard ready to hit free agency, Dallas officially folded on their core of the future. Said Mavs coach Rick Carlisle after the playoff loss when asked by reporters whether he expected Rajon Rondo to suit up for the Mavs again. No, I don't. What remains of this deal? Well, Jay Crowder, for a time, was an integral part of a very good Boston team in the Eastern Conference before being shipped to Cleveland and then Utah last season. Dwight Powell, meanwhile, is all that the Mavericks have left of this deal. And after a couple of uneven seasons, he was rewarded with a four-year, $37 million deal, which was all the stranger, although he has shown signs of improvement. 
though I still question how high his ceiling ultimately is. All in all, this deal was a terrible loss for the Mavericks. Number 3 Passing on Giannis Antetokounmpo in the 2013 draft. Ooh boy, here we are again. In 2013, fresh off their second straight failed free agency period, Dallas showed it hadn't learned its lesson. Dallas wanted a big fish, someone that they could build their franchise around for the foreseeable future. So rather than focus on building the team from within, Mark Cuban decided to continue his string of long, long draft negligence and take it a step further. He did this by drafting Kelly Olenek and then trading him to Boston for the 18th pick, who was Shane Larkin, instead of taking Giannis. And that just hurts my soul. Considering Olenek himself was at least a decent piece for the Boston Celtics in recent years. Now, obviously, he's moved on, but at the time, he was a good role player for them. And obviously, we know what the Greek freak has become. You look over there, meanwhile, at Shane Larkin, and I think he was with Boston last year, but the guy has never panned out to be anything of significance. And it just makes it all the more puzzling for the Mavericks that in their effort to save just a little bit more money to try and keep that max salary slot open, they literally bet the future and lost again. Since coming into the league, Giannis has averaged 14.9 points, shooting nearly 50% while chipping in seven boards and four assists. Last year, he was a legitimate MVP candidate for much of the season, becoming one of the most versatile and dominant players in the world today. Still not convinced? Last season, Giannis averaged 26.9 points on 52.9% from the field. He shot nearly 31% from behind the arc, averaged 10 boards and 4.8 assists, not to mention 1.5 steals and 1.4 blocks per game. In short, the Greek freak is called the Greek freak for a reason. He is an athletically dominant player, probably as good as you're going to find this side of LeBron James. This move literally killed my soul. Well, maybe not literally, but it certainly didn't help my health at the time. Sure, Dallas tried to right this wrong somewhat this year, taking Giannis's little brother, Kostas Antetokounmpo, with the 60th overall pick. But he's an even more raw player coming out than Giannis was. And as a result, I don't think he has as high of a ceiling, but I also think he's probably going to take a couple of years to develop even into a decent role player for the Mavericks, assuming he gets brought up to their main roster. I hope the best, but this feels a little bit like overcorrecting, trying to fix the wrong by literally taking his younger brother and hoping he can be anything the same of what Giannis was. I mean, really, there's no telling how different this team would have looked in recent years had Cuban simply drafted. And it was Cuban's decision, don't get it twisted, Donnie Nelson loved Giannis. It was Mark Cuban's decision to pass on the Greek freak in order to save a little more money to try and pursue a big fish, and it blew up in his face in spectacular fashion. Side note, obviously this never could have happened, but could you imagine the hypothetical of Dennis Smith Jr., Luka Doncic, and Giannis Antetokounmpo all on one team? <gasps> Number two! Letting Tyson Chandler walk. Twice. Something tells me Mark Cuban would probably cite the previous entry on this list as a bigger regret, as it would have had much further reaching implications into the future. However, this one still stands out for a lot of Mavs fans, myself included. Sure, Giannis would have given the Mavs a bona fide stud, but Tyson Chandler was the heart and soul of that 2011 championship run. Bringing intensity and attitude, Chandler helped lead the Mavericks to their lone title by way of a major upset against LeBron James's Miami Heat. It was the pinnacle of everything Dallas and Dirk Nowitzki had been building toward for nearly two decades. So how did Dallas celebrate that title? Right, by immediately blowing up the title team. Wait, what? Hello darkness, my old friend. Yeah, Dallas essentially let Tyson walk, more or less to New York through a sign-and-trade deal. It was a sign of just horrible things to come for Dallas. That year, all we heard was to keep the powder dry. Remember that? That fun catchphrase? 
But by the time the playoffs rolled around, the defending champions found themselves swept out of the first round by the Oklahoma City Thunder. Tyson Chandler, meanwhile, won Defensive Player of the Year and became an All-Star for the first time. Funny how that works. Flash forward four years. Dallas has stumbled and bumbled through roster overhaul after roster overhaul in an attempt to find a formula that would not only help them win their first playoff series since the 2011 Finals, by the way, they're still trying to do that, but to also make a legitimate run at another championship. The Knicks, meanwhile, had grown frustrated with nagging injuries hampering Tyson Chandler and his strong-willed leadership demanding full effort out of an underachieving team. The Mavs then decided, mere days after signing away Chandler Parsons from the Houston Rockets, to swing a deal with New York and bring their championship center back home where he belonged. On paper, the move made Dallas dangerous as all get out. But when it became apparent the team's point guard position was a significant glaring weakness, Mark Cuban was forced to pull the trigger on another move, the Rajon Rondo trade, leading to the whole thing falling apart. Dallas would lose to Houston that year in the first round in just five games, and Cuban would again shun Tyson Chandler for a chance to chase that mythical big fish. Coincidentally, DeAndre Jordan. Hmm. Funny how that comes full circle. Number one. Not re-signing Steve Nash in 2004. Mark Cuban himself has called this his biggest regret as the Mavs owner, and therefore it is the unquestioned number one on this list. Behind Dirk Nowitzki's ascension into superstardom and Steve Nash's elite offensive playmaking, Dallas charged into the Western Conference Finals in the 2002-2003 season. In fact, were it not for Nowitzki suffering a sprained MCL and missing almost the entire series against the San Antonio Spurs, Dallas may well have won it all that year. Instead, they tried to rebuild on the fly, changing out faces like Nick Van Exel and Rafe LaFrenz for Antoine Walker and Anton Jameson. On paper, it sounded like a pair of upgrades, especially with Van Exel's swift decline, but the move did not pan out for the Mavericks as they were bounced in the first round of the playoffs against the Sacramento Kings in just five games. That offseason, feeling free agent Steve Nash was breaking down physically, Cuban made what he felt was a savvy move, declining to offer a max contract and letting Phoenix swoop in and steal the Canadian point guard away. The result? Nash would go on to win back-to-back -back MVPs immediately for the Suns and would bounce Cuban's Mavericks in the second round of the playoffs the following year in 2005. Ultimately, Nash would never win an NBA championship, nor would he even make a finals appearance. But his absence was felt mightily in the 2006 finals when Dirk led the Mavs to a 2-0 series lead before Dallas would go on to lose in six games. Dirk and Nash missed out on their first title due to an injury in 2003, and had they not separated, they may have won two or three together before it was all said and done. As I said at the beginning of this piece, talent evaluation, whether by way of draft or free agency or trades, whatever, it's not an easy task. No one has a perfect record in the matter. But ultimately what's plagued Dallas most in the majority of these instances is its obsessive pursuit over acquiring a big fish rather than acknowledging you're in a rebuild. It took Dallas years to admit it needed to rebuild, and really it was only when they could no longer make the playoffs at all that they finally acknowledged it, reluctantly even then. Had Dallas done something like Boston, where for two to three years they essentially said, okay, this is it, we're going to lose a bunch of games, but we're going to rack up high draft picks, imagine what Dallas could have done. Not only would they have had the Greek freak, but they would have had four or five more high draft picks with a good chance of panning out. Now, you got to hit on those draft picks, and obviously Boston has, but I don't know, man. I think Dallas has gotten it right in the draft the last two years with Dennis Smith Jr. and Luka Doncic, but imagine if they had committed to the draft previously the way they committed to it these last two years, where they could be. If you didn't notice, by the way, save for number one on this list, Steve Nash, every one of these instances occurred 
after the 2011 championship. Now, that might just be a coincidence or that might just be windowed thinking where I'm only thinking in terms of post-title. But I think most of Cuban's greatest slip-ups have occurred since then. I could talk about the Rafe LaFriend's contract. I could talk about something like Sean Bradley or bringing in Dennis Rodman or something like that. But I don't think those are as great of failure as the items outlined here. But let me know what you think, guys. Comment below. Tell me if I'm right. Tell me if I'm wrong. If you thought of something I missed, let me know. I will gladly hear you out. And if I agree, I'll shout you out in the next Mavericks Fast Break live stream. And we'll have a good time debating it if we need to. But that's all my time for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I've been DDP with the Dallas Prospect. And remember, every legend was once a prospect. Hey, this is Mario. This is Alan. This is Barry. From Dark Avenue. And remember... Every legend was once a prospect. prospect.